Yes, hello everyone. Uh, good evening, good evening, Saul. Um, good evening. At our first creation report. So, what is it about? Basically, I think that uh, um, I have been very rarely uh, hosting shows at my channel, at my YouTube channel. And there, are, there is so many things that um, we can share and I'm restricting myself to Facebook and so on. And I think um, it's important that we share what we are learning on a daily basis and also what we see that atheist channels uh, claim and then um, we can talk about it and eventually provide our perspective about these things. So I actually prepared an introduction uh, PowerPoint here in regards of the topic tonight, which is about if uh, DNA stores instructional information. But I am not able. I'm not able to actually visualize it. So I'll just uh, check out while we are here conversation, uh, having a conversation, if I can set it up. So, Sal, let me ask you, um, what do you think? Does DNA store instructional information in the sense that it ins instructs to do things? It stores some instructional information in the development of an organism. According to the central dogma of molecular biology, it gives specifications. Parts of the DNA, and I emphasize only parts, in eukaryotes, it's maybe for, for like a human, it's only about 2% that specify specifically the sequences for the proteins. There are other parts of DNA that do other things than providing instructions. There is, um, so minimally, yes, it does provide some set of instructions for uh, creating proteins. That's, that's a very well accepted dogma by, uh, uh, independently uh, described by Francis Crick and, and James Watson. Now, I will point out Emery Moyna and I had a discussion on cortical inheritance, and I showed that there is a lot of instructions in the construction of an organism, particularly eukaryotes, that is totally outside the DNA. And it is still very hard to experimentally show these aspects and really have a handle on it, but we know it's there. We know it's there because of some of our experiments. We we know if we break certain things, it just doesn't rebuild. So um, I know that was a long answer to your question. Uh, DNA holds instructions for building certain parts of- Yeah, sometimes uh, when, I, when I mentioned this uh, speed, he said, oh, but it's just an one and a half or 2%. So, if we are making a calculation that the human gen genome has about 3 billion nucleotides, so one and a half percent, that would be about 45 to 50 million nucleotides. That is already a huge amount of information, isn't it, Sal? That is a huge amount. And now we can actually go through various calculations. Uh, if we assume that 3 billion or 3.3 gigabases or whatever the number is, the current number is, that equates to 6.6 .6 gigabits of Shannon information. If we only assume 1% is uh, coding for anything, th that would be like, what, eight megabytes? So you could do the math, you divide, uh, you take 1% of 6.6 .6, uh, uh, gigabits, you divide by eight, you'll eventually end up to be about eight megabytes. Does anyone seriously think eight megabytes is sufficient to make something as complicated as a human being, or let's say even parts of a human being, like say the immune system or the brain? And so let's go to the figure, higher figure of 10%. Do you think 80 megabytes is gonna be enough? That's just the rhetorical question I keep putting forward. And I'm just like, guys, do you realize how complex a human being is? Uh, do you really think 80 megabytes is enough to do the job and to do it really well? And, and uh, that actually led to my exploration of cortical inheritance because if we even think that uh, 
Do I have my cell phone here? Okay, I don't have it handy. But you think about a cell phone that has maybe three gigabytes of RAM. Or do you think do you think that a um, a human being could be coded with 800 megabytes? I mean, my cell phone has three times, at least three times as much memory. Do you think that's enough? And so I said, okay, the information to construct a human being is distributed. It's distributed in the glycome. It's distributed in the organelles. There are all sorts of instructional manuals there that we're only touching upon and we're, we're stumbling on it. It's just, and I specifically asked when I was at class in the National Institutes of Health studying chromatin modifications. And we would, I was looking at these pictures of mouse embryos. I don't know if I, I might be able to show it briefly. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna scramble to get it if you wanted to say a few words while I grab it. <laughs> <laughs> and, no, feel, feel free. No, I think um, if we consider that the human body has about 37 trillion cells, so does the, the, the position of each single cell not have to be instructed somehow? And if we have just, even let's suppose that even the 3 billion nucleotides would be instructional, how would that be sufficient to instruct the position of all these 37 trillion cells. So I think this alone, this, this number, this figure alone is already evidence that there has to be more epigenetic information which is in play in order to construct comp uh, organismal complexity. And as you said, the glycome is uh, the glycan code um, on the surface of the membrane of cells. Uh, that's already uh, a far, a bigger um, uh, sized uh, information content just there. And I have collected over 41 different epigenetic codes and languages, and they are all involved um, in uh, information sharing and organismal building. So, I mean, it is obvious that genetic information alone is not sufficient but there has to be much more epigenetic information involved. So I was taking a class on chromatin modifications, which we sometimes call epigenetic. That word is abused a lot, so I, I you know, <laughs> I may avoid using it. But let me uh, try to explain what this picture is. This is a picture of a mouse embryo at various stages in time. So this is like three hours, eight hours uh, longer. So A, B, C, D, E. Now, unfortunately, F, G, H, I, J are just control. So just ignore that. It took me a while to figure out that diagram. So we could see how this embryo, uh, the on the top is the paternal DNA, on the bottom is the maternal DNA from uh, so this would be the DNA from the sperm of the dad and the DNA from the um, ovomeg of the mother. But now it is joined together in the embryo. After eight hours, you could see that uh, the, the lighting indicates the number of methylation marks on the, on the DNA. So it's being flipped on and it's being even, even more DNA is being flipped on. But then look at panel C. Uh, even beyond eight hours, at some point, the paternal DNAs, all the methylation marks are erased. The epigenetic marks are just like rebooted. And wow. I asked my professor, I said, how does the cell know to do that? Where is that information stored? If you think about it, uh, no one's ever answered the question, Okay, how do you know that, like, say, at 16 hours, you're going to start to, to reformat? Where is that information stored? Where does it say that on the DNA? Okay, let's erase the methylation marks. So there's more instructions in the process of development than we currently know where it resides. The professor, who was a postdoctoral fellow, a very bright, uh, very bright researcher, she said, <laughs> well, actually asked the, posed the question to two two of the professors. One of them was actually a pioneer of the histone code. So I was really privileged to be in that class. And he said, no one knows. And then I asked a similar question to his postdoc, who was also co-teaching the class. He said, oh, the cells are very smart. <laughs> uh, 
she was just smiling. It's like, well, she basically said, no one knows, but the, the cell is very smart. It has a lot of the instructions. So that's all to emphasize. Um, all this, all these attempts to trivialize what the cell does, I just think it's kind of ridiculous because the people that actually study this, oh, by the way, so let's just complete the picture here. This is now when we first have the first mitosis, now that the embryo splits into two and then it eventually becomes four and you can see the changes in the methylation states. I have another, um, I have another, there are even better graphs now show the histones in all sorts of colors. You could actually see the cells differentiating even when you had the first, say, um, 16 or 32 cells. You could actually see the different markings on each of them. Even at that stage, they have different epigenetic states and they can colorize it. And I keep asking the question, where is the information stored that decides when and where that these changes happen? No one has an answer to that. No one. And it's, I it's, asked it's, it's, Rick, yeah, when, no I was, one when I was is. in Seattle, I asked Richard Sternberg about this, and he said the same thing. We have no clue where this epigenetic information is stored. So uh, this is uh, I think you you said uh, uh, some time ago that science is now in a in a in a in a evolutionary stage, let's say, where they are starting to tackling and exploring and unraveling these questions, where this, this information actually is stored. So I think that, I mean, the paradigm shift has already happened. Even if we advance understanding and knowing where this information is stored, what this already means is that the quantity of information in organisms to make uh, multicellular organisms is far bigger than just genomic information. And then you have to ask yourself, can that be the product of undirected evolutionary mechanisms? And I think the answer to this question is a clear no. That has to be pre-programmed information. Would you, would you agree with that, Sal? Um, we got cut off briefly, um, but when you're talking about we're, we're beginning to see, yes, I would agree, uh, we're, we're happening upon it. And one thing that we'll hear from cell biologists, the evolutionary biologists will say that biology's junk and clumsy, the famous words by Charles Darwin um, uh, about the devil's chaplain on the blundering things in nature. You don't hear that from the people that actually study at the cellular and molecular level. Rarely. There, there are a few like Larry Moran, but many of them will say words like exquisite, innovative, artful, masterful, clever, crafty. Uh, and you're just like, yeah, they, they'll say everything except intelligently designed, but those words are, are, are often pretty good. Now, what this picture was, it's similar to the one I showed earlier. Now, this is a picture of uh, C. elegans, a worm. And again, this is the embryonic development. Uh, this is at two cells, four cells, et cetera. And what they're highlighting with the colors here, those are, that's the lineage that will lead to the gametes. So even at some point, um, unfortunately, if, uh, if you could see it here in panel F, you could see the two red dots there with the little blue surrounding it. Even at that stage, there all these the reason they're different colors is the histone modifications are different on the cells those histone modifications identify the cells even in the embryo that are going to become the gametes they're going to be involved in gametes and reproduction so even at that stage it's already anticipating the next generation in in terms of reproduction and it's identifying the cells so all these cells are unique and they're modified they may have the same by and large, the same identical DNA, but they have totally different epigenetic marks. And that's what I like about pictures like this. You could actually see what the epigenetic changes are, and they're different between the cells. So even though we, you know, in general, approximately, we could say that all 1 trillion cells in a human being, or 100 trillion, or 50 trillion, whatever the number is, they may have essentially one genome. That's not exactly correct, but it's close but they have 100 trillion epigenomes. 
100 trillion epigenomes. Every cell has a different epigenome than another. Wow. Where's wow. the information that stores, that creates this? How does this decompress? Where is it stored? No one knows. And, and so when I so, hear speed of sound, I'm just trying to trivialize the DNA by saying it's only 2%. I'm like, you know, DNA isn't everything. And this is proof that it's not everything because somewhere this information has to be stored and there's a lot of it. You need information to store 100 trillion epigenomes and to express it. Um, so, I, you know, I, I just don't buy it. That yeah. it's, that's, that biology's trivial. That, that's just that's ridiculous. So Would you say, Sal, that each single cell therefore has a, a very specific proprietary epigenome which is different from the neighboring cell even if the, the the cell type is the same yes yes now it might be hard to establish that for the whole body for say a human but it is accepted fact for all the brain cells every neuron cell is different and if you think about it that makes sense how do you remember how do we, how does a computer work it has when it stores information, it has to put it in a specific address and then retrieve it from a specific address. Every address has to be unique. In a comparable way, when the brain is storing information, not just like learning, give it a very simple example. When you hear someone's voice and you recognize it, so you're learning to hear someone's voice and then and you don't even realize that... Uh, your brain is storing this away and it's retrieving it. It's doing pattern matching. Same for smells, same for tastes. There's a lot of learning that's going on. It has to address the right brain cells in the right location to, to grab it. And part of that is differentiation among the cells. We still don't know how this is exactly done. And it's done on several levels. First off in the chromatin, the chromatin is likely changed between each of the cells there are slight differences based on the uh, line one transposons. It creates uh, slight changes in the actual genome. It transposes pieces of the genome so that each genome is actually a little bit different between cells. This was established in the Mayo Clinic and, and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. They said, oh my, there's most, what they call mosaicism in the brain cells, in the neural cells. But who knows what else is going on? I actually, when I was taking, studying neuroscience, I saw, when I, uh, I saw how there is alternative splicing, and and um, alternative splicing that was marking little pieces of the neuron, in in the, in the receptors of the neurons. My jaw was dropping. I said. There's so many things that are slightly different that are just so finely organized. And uh, it has to coordinate um, all these connections. The human brain has more connections than all the switches and routers of the World Wide Web. It, it's just I hear phenomenal. It that it the numbers are astronomical. The, I hear that it has more switches than the number of stars in the universe. Uh, I've not heard that number, but it's a big number. Being able to manage that amount of distributed processing is just insane. And there are probably levels of its operation that are beyond anything we uh, we can comprehend. So um, I saw Cy Gart said, Who, uh, who's saying biology is trivial? Um, well, I had a, a quote in mind. Let me see. Um, Maybe it's not exactly those words, but uh, it's a sentiment of some people. Uh, there, there was, uh, it's called uh, Darwin's famous uh, uh, quote on the devil's chaplain. I'm sorry, you're just seeing me just Google it here. Uh, <laughs> no problem. My internet is, uh, slow uh, I, I I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and maybe I'll, when I find it I'll I'll just read the okay. quote okay so um, yeah I mean I so I tried to find out how many different neuron cells there are and science has no clue about that 
have they advanced somehow in responding that question? I've heard a number of 100 billion um, in the central nervous system and the no, numbers no, no. fluctuated between 80 billion no, or whatever. Not, no, I'm not asking the, the total number of neurons. I am asking about the different kind of neurons. Does science has an answer today about how many different ones there are? Um, there are major families of them. There could be many. I mean, in uh, I, I just remembered I had, they summarized it on the page for the neuron classes, but maybe there are very many, many more than I, I saw, but we had to at least study the very basic ones. Like a really basic one would be just like in the retina. Um, that's a very specialized optical. And then you can imagine then something for the ear or uh, something related to, to smell. Uh, but then there are all sorts of these special ones in the brain. And I, I, my jaw dropped when I saw all the different cell types. The amazing thing is all these different cell types come from the same embryo. Just remarkable. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I mean, I ask myself, how can just one stem cell differentiate 37 trillion cells and knowing exactly where they have to be located in the human body. That's just crazy, you know? Right. And, and it goes beyond that. Think about the process of healing. When I worked briefly in the nanomolecular uh, science group of, um, uh, of the think tech I used to work for, uh, MITRE, I mean, just really passing, but I was very fascinated by the work. Uh, at their big annual meeting, they said, okay, the two biggest problems we are dealing with in building nano machines is how to make them self-assembling and self-healing. And I was like, yeah, self-healing is a pretty big problem. I mean, just imagine having a computer and it gets broken and it self-heals. The human body yeah. is able to do that with cuts. So that means there's some sort of distributed processing, like in Bitcoin, if you damage parts of the net of the Bitcoin network, it's able to reconstitute. It's still, still able to hold together. There is some serious um, technology there in being able to coordinate so many cells that they could uh, they could affect self healing, and so it's more than just ordinary development from one point. It's developing from one point and then overcoming all, all these obstacles of damage and then varying environments and nutrition. So, uh, yeah, how does it do it? That was that's still an unsolved problem in human engineering, how do we make self-healing machines? The reason that's important is there's a lot of thermal noise and quantum noise. When you start to get into molecules, self-repair actually has to be very significant. That's why we have self-repair in DNA. There's a lot of spontaneous chemical reactions that when you deal with very small systems that you don't worry about in like larger scale systems, like a regular computer, you get down to where individual molecules become critical, uh, self-repair becomes very important. We don't know how to build anything near like what biology can do with self-repair. Yeah, that is really all inspiring. And as I said in some uh, streams that I am studying the ribosome and uh, discovering that during the biogenesis process of the ribosome, that it goes through test drives or, or it is checking if the individual proteins and um, ribosomal RNAs, if they are uh, properly folded or not, and if they are working or not. I mean, this is just awe-inspiring. I mean, we know that like, if you have a factory and you make a car, then you have to check if the individual parts, if they are properly built. And of course, this is an intelligently designed process with the goal to have a functional end product. And seeing that in the ribosome, that's just amazing. It is not only during the ribosomal uh, um, translation process that there are several different error check and repair mechanisms inbuilt, but also during the construction of the ribosome, the cell knows when the, the individual parts are correctly synthesized and when not. And when they are not correctly synthesized, then the proteasome discards these uh, these strands and recycles it. 
And if that is not there right from the start, then these uh, mis misfolded uh, and wrong proteins or uh, 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 ribosomal RNA strands, they would accumulate in the cell and then uh, probably kill the cell. So this is an all or nothing uh, situation. Either you have all this kind of error check and repair mechanisms built in right from the start, or you will not have life. Uh, I found the quote, I, I'd like to share it. So uh, this is a sentiment of many evolutionary biologists. It says, what a book, a devil's chaplain. By the way, a devil's chaplain was Robert Taylor. He was a rogue minister who was atheist, he would be like an anti-theist today, but he was just really crazy. So devil's chaplain refers to someone who is um, very anti-Christian. Uh, he was he was an ex-minister. So, so Darwin said, what a book a devil's chaplain might write on the clumsy, wasteful, blundering, low, and hor horridly cruel works of nature. So he didn't you know, that is one viewpoint, you know, since the fall, there are lots of cruel things happening in nature and there are a lot of things broken. We see sickness abundance, but yet um, we see incredible levels of sophistication and intelligent design at the kind of the Christian viewpoint that we were intelligently designed, but also subject to a curse. And, yeah. and uh, so uh, that sentiment was carried by Jerry Coyne his book, Why Evolution is True, one of his, a lot of the arguments I've been hearing are these bad design arguments, like you saying the yeah. inverted retina and all. And I, I'm just like, yeah, you know, it just gave it a a little time. And, and the physicists were saying, oh no, this is a great design feature, this inverted retina. And I, I talked to an electrical engineer and he was just like, wow, it does that. And he's an antenna engineer. And he, he does a lot of stuff with electromagnetism. when when he saw how this was put together, he said, that's incredible. He said, I, I work with these waveguides and we have these optical waveguides inside the eye. He said, uh, in the designs that he's approving and working with, he said, these things have to be so precise. He said, you can't be off. It's not gonna guide the wave. You need to have a really good engineer to build this. And, and, and so I just hear that at every level, especially the cell biologist. And, the funny thing is the people joining the fray now are the biophysicists. They're the ones that understand the engineering. And I wanted to say one other thing about error correction, because some uh, evolutionary biologists or evolutionary leaning, they're saying, well, you know, what's an, what an incompetent designer that he would have to make something that needs error correction. He would get it right the first time. And I'm like, no, no, <laughs> there is a reason that we have the Shannon theorem. There's a consequence of Shannon's theorem of communication. So everyone quotes Shannon because he, he had the major breakthrough in communication. He realized that one way, the best way to have a communication system that can pack as much, um, say, quote unquote, bandwidth, the proper term is channel capacity meaning if you want to put as many bits as possible on a disk, if you want to pump through as many bits through a wire, the best way to do it is not to have perfect signals. It's to have signals that have slight errors because of the noise, and then to correct it on the fly afterward. So your compact disk has read Solomon error correction, both in the read and write. And when biologists were telling me the designer's incompetent because he had to put error correction to put errors, I'm like, no, you guys do not understand communication theory. <laughs> Any electrical engineer that works with communication will recognize that this is genius. This is the way to do it if you want to, if you want to compress as much information in the tiniest space possible with the least amount of energy and matter, you use error correction. So the, the thing is they're viewing this from a philosophical standpoint. They're not viewing it from an engineering utilitarian standpoint. When you, you look at it that way, it begins to make sense. And that's when you start to see the genius. Yeah. I mean, as I said previously, unless you have all these error check and repair mechanisms right from the start, you cannot have life. Exactly. Well, I didn't have anything else. Uh, um, I guess we're still kind of figuring out what we're going to do with these shows. <laughs> um, I will say, uh, if you're not aware, there's a, 
um, I'll try to keep let I'll try to uh, keep tabs on your channel for your events. We have a public channel, I mean a public calendar that lists all the events that um, Standing for Truth, Logical, Plausible, Probable, um, the Evidence Reason channels, which are mine, and then I, I'll put you on the calendar. Today was a packed day. There were si at least six events. So after yes, this, there's yes. going to be Kent Hovind on Modern Day Debate, and then an hour later, Standing for Truth with Snake was right or something. So <laughs> it's a packed day. Yes, yes. Um, I mean... Um, I would be interested to have something on a daily basis, but I'm not sure yet if that will work. It depends also on people actually joining and uh, willing to have uh, sh and share uh, these these topics and discuss them, you know. So it doesn't depend only on me, but I mean, it can be at your channel, it can be at mine, or we can... Uh, um, figure that out what would be best, you know? I mean, what we are seeing is that there are so many atheist channels out there and uh, providing um, misinformation. And I think uh, it is important that we are putting out what we believe and justify our reasons to believe. Um, Dr. Carter um, said he'd be interested in um, helping us whenever he could. So that'd be great, even if we only get him every other week or so, just to have oh, him join sure. us. I would be, uh, it'd be helpful for me to um, uh, work with you on, on your channel. I, 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 it's difficult for me to do um, live streams. Like um, I, I mentioned this uh, to you in uh, backstage, but yeah. I'll, I'll mention yes. it for the viewers. Uh, one reason I do recorded shows a lot is because of my mom's condition. When we were recording the biotic message, I had to pause the the recording for 20 minutes while I took care of mom. But for the viewer standpoint, uh, uh, it seemed like one continuous show. And it, uh, so I'd be happy to drop in um, uh, occasionally. Like I'll try to at least come by once or twice a week. To your show yeah i invited yeah. lena too and she said she would join us and she's all all around i mean i think the most difficult part for a new channel my my channel is not so new anymore but in order to have something let's say more frequently uh, we we need to have at least a few people which are willing to join and start these conversations and then i think uh, from there on it will be easier to to have people starting to know about the channel and willing to join and have these conversations. Well, what I was going to suggest is um, maybe if you had a topic, you can have a show and then I could come and bring a topic. Um, one that I did a little research and then we could talk about it. Uh, Cause we, I find all these either uh, even at least some of the abstracts of some of these original papers or even in the popular press, they're interesting things. There's also things about, I wanted to have a talk on the peer reviewed process in certain areas of academia. And um, it's not directly related to science, but it should be eye opening with what goes on because if, if academia is letting certain disciplines get away with the kind of nonsense they have with peer review, they ought to let uh, some of the discussions we have also get in university. That's never going to happen. Um, it might, but we'll we'll see. So, um, <clears throat> what I was going to suggest is I'll, I'll try to, uh, if, if this is a good time, I'll try to schedule a couple shows to, to drop in. If for some reason I get um, called away, you'll have to take over <laughs> the uh, rest of the conversation. But I, I will. I, I do want to support your channel, and um, um, oh, Sigart says I'm a major authority on peer review from working at the NIH. Um, actually, uh, I'm. I think a lot of the science peer review is good. It's other disciplines like, say, social science that I just wanted to highlight. <laughs> so um, I, I, I think very highly of the NIH. I think very highly of the uh, peer review that goes on in chemistry. It's it's excellent, but I just wanted to to I, I made a comment uh, just before my channel got 
scratched by YouTube before they reinstated it, but they scratched it. They said, this is scam. This is misleading information. Uh, Did they uh, say that? Yeah, that they, t they sent me a nasty letter after I had my three chemistry lectures and one molecular biology lecture. And <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I, I put it up. I put the whole, whole ordeal up on my channel. And I, I said, well, in Duke, uh, in certain universities, and I, I was specifically talking about Duke University. I'm shocked, Sal. They, I they, mean, that, they, that's censoring. <laughs> they are censoring content because they are disagreeing with what we believe. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, if they're messed up. What's really scary is what happened to Alan, I mean, David Woods, uh, Act 17 Apologetics. He has half a million subscribers. And they 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 demonetize his channel for hate speech. And I'm just like, what? Wow. Because they have Muslim jihadists advocating for killing of ex-Muslims whom, whom they consider infidels. I said, so these channels are still monetized. That's perfectly fine to advocate killing of a Muslim who became a Christian. That's perfectly fine by YouTube standards. But then they shut down. They they, they didn't shut down his channel altogether yet. But they sent him kind of a similar nasty letter with no specifics about what he specifically said that was offensive. Wow. And and and, and like, well, I can't imagine that he said anything as offensive as killing another person just because they deconverted from one particular faith. But that's okay with YouTube for, for the Muslims. And he said there's just a move. So what happened in my case is still mysterious. They, there was no explanation as to how it happened. I think there might have been an auto bot and then there might have been people just constantly pressing the report button. And some YouTube administrator said, well, I just, you know, this is too much trouble. Let's just ax the channel. I only had 17 subscribers. My chemistry lectures had three views and <laughs> they shut me down. <laughs> they got disturbed with your channel with just that number of subscribers. That's yeah. crazy. It's unbelievable. So, um, where was I headed? Oh, I was talking about Duke University. They charge over a quarter million dollars to do something like gender studies. And I was just going to highlight the kind of garbage that they that passes peer review. And three professors said, this is just terrible what's happening. They, they put, um, they said, we're just going to, we're just going to make up stuff and see if it passes peer review in that discipline. And they were getting, <laughs> they were getting in quote unquote prestigious social science journals. It was utter garbage. So I might cover that tomorrow. I mean, they're they're talking about why why the field of uh, physics and cosmology and astronomy needs to have more um, uh, more gender awareness and uh, through interpretive dance. It was just hilarious. <laughs> and so. Um, I mean, just a little levity. So where I was headed with this, I can support your channel, and thank you for saying for for our our agreement that you know I can cross rebroadcast it on my channel. So what I could do is I could first broadcast it on your channel, and then I'll broadcast it on mine, and um, uh, ho hopefully because people get to hear it first on your channel, mine will just be like uh, you know later. Yes, I have an article here about the peer review of flawed process at the heart of science and journals. And I mean, what we still see is some people, they are so focused on thinking that science papers, they are proclaiming the absolute truth and that there is no errors. And there are people which think that someone having a PhD is a grant that that person knows what, what it's talking about. And anyone that doesn't have a degree is considered as less authoritative. And I think th th these are very flawed concepts. We need to be skeptics about, I mean, I am skeptic about everything that I read in science papers. And we have to make a distinguish distinguishing between what they actually elucidate in regards of mechanisms that are seen when we are talking about biology or biochemistry, when let's say a science paper writes about the ribosome, how, how it works, how it's assembled together and so forth. Okay, so there is not much room to say something which is not adequate. But when they are writing, oh, this thing evolved, and then you have to ask yourself, well, how do, how do they know this? 
how do they know that it evolved? You know, and you see that is underlying in all, uh, basically in all the biology, biology science literature. And that's where I say we have to be skeptic about this because many of these, um, uh, how can I say, uh, implicit statements, they are not based on what we know. They are just based on the philosophical framework upon which uh, uh, the biological sciences uh, rest, which is evolution. Well, um, I, if we're going to try to do daily shows, maybe they should be short. Um, we'd probably wear ourselves out and the audience if we if we had uh, shows longer than than an hour. Uh, I think the short ones. I don't know how speed of sound does it, where they're just just sitting there for three hours at a time, just bashing creationists. Um, mm. um, <laughs> I, I don't. I. Um, even though I would totally enjoy hanging out with you for three hours every day, Otangelo, I'm not going to get anything <laughs> done. Um, I'd like no, to. We, we can we can stop the stream after ten in in an hour, an hour total. Now it's forty minutes, so in maximum twenty minutes we stop it. Uh, and especially if you have something else to do yeah. right now, so just let me know and we can close it earlier. No problem. Yeah, I, I think I think we'll be able to do da daily things. Uh, we have a higher probability of it if we keep it short. And if we're not able to finish the topic, we could. That's an excuse to to go on for next. The next day we yeah, have sure. another topic, and sure. um, l let me see. I. Uh, um, I'll, I'll advertise your channel on on my channel, and if I could promote my channel a little bit, my if one goes to evidenceandreasons.org, I'm really trying more to promote my website. Since I had my encounter with YouTube, I'm not. I don't want to be at the mercy of YouTube, and uh, um, so I'm trying to. I'm trying to tell myself to de-emphasize my YouTube channels. I don't if you know if there is a good alternative to YouTube right now. I think Vimeo is good, but they are more about you have to pay to have. I think you have to pay the, uh, to to uh, upload the content there. I'm not sure, but um, can, can, I think I think YouTube has basically a monopoly. There are not many good alternatives right now. If I'm they they have a near monopoly. If, if if you can give me. Um, Moderator privileges. I could post my website address on on the uh, chat here. I don't actually. Oh, okay. Let me put that in. The, I, yes, yes. You sure I can do that? No problem. But just a minute. So my uh, just uh, while. Tangela is doing this. My website is www.evidenceandreasons.org. And from there, there is a link to, to my two so YouTube my channels. Uh, while one Tangela is doing this, my, well, one of, one of the YouTube channels is Evidence and Reasons um, for the Christian Faith. The other is Evidence Reasons Academy. The Evidence Reasons Academy is where I'll be posting just mostly science lectures. I'm doing that primarily so I could relearn what I've forgotten and that I need to be up to date on and skillful at to do my professional work. So I'm giving, um, I probably build, <laughs> I'm estimating I have about 120 uh, chemistry lectures plus general chemistry lectures plus solved homework. So that's equal to like two semesters of general chemistry. And then I'll move on to organic chemistry and then molecular biology. I'm working with Dr. Change. Laura Tan on her molecular biology series. So the Evidence Reasons Academy is just really for s serious science and nerds uh, to, to, to better equip people. Now, there probably is a more efficient way of teaching these topics, but I'm not going to find it uh, unless I go back through all of the material and then have a chance to think about it. Because I, I really do think that we could teach the essentials without having to essentially train people to be chemists and uh, professional biologist. There's there's probably a way, but I haven't figured it out yet. And so as I'm giving these lectures, I'll be thinking about more efficient ways that maybe I, I could compress um, the essentials for someone that might be an IT person or uh, like jungle jargon, someone who's a uh, uh, aviation mechanic to be able to retrain someone 
in these areas just so they could understand the literature that they could probably go through um, that they could probably go through and read peer-reviewed papers without getting intimidated. And so, uh, Dr. Gart had a very kind word. He said, Sal, that is a terrific service. Thank you, Dr. Gart. And uh, um, um, uh, that's what I may be doing in, in the coming year. It, it depends on my professional workload as that, as my professional workload may go down, uh, I may have more time for this. And if it goes up, we'll see. So for those who don't know, I work, I, my contract work is with Dr. John Sanford, and he also details me out to various other laboratories around the country. And the contract was winding down, but he seems to be wanting more work for me of late. And I had a conversation with him on protein biology today. And so I just don't know where that's going. But on the other hand, um, I have to be better at the chemistry than where I'm at if I'm gonna to continue to advance. Um, for, for those that don't know my background, I, I was in the aerospace and defense industry. And so that was a real, that was a real almost not quite 180 to, to go into biology. And I remember my conversation with Dr. Sanford in 2014, I said, I don't know anything. I would, you know, he said, you're hired, but I said, I don't know anything about biology. He said, don't worry, you're fine. You have the right skill sets. <laughs> so, uh, cause he wanted engineers on his research team uh, and uh, he said, I'll, I'll, you know, he sent me to the NIH to, to, to learn biology and uh, at the FAES graduate school. So um, I'm, I'm having to just trying to, you know, try to uh, keep my, my knowledge current. And part of that, one way to, to learn is to teach. Yeah, I think it, uh, if someone comes from an engineering background, and it is also my background, I'm a machine designer, and this helps tremendously to understand what happens in biochemistry because what we see has analogy to what we make. And uh, I mean, the manufacturing process has analogy and uh, it has similarities. So that helps us a lot to understand these things. And I think when you understand that intelligence is required to have a machine made for a specific purpose because you have worked in that field, then that helps uh, tremendously to understand that the same happens in biology. And that um, if you have not a purpose from the beginning, then th there is no way that unguided events could actually construct so complex um, uh, mechanisms and machines that we see in biology. And um, yeah. I just found out Dr. Uh, Gart was very kind. He, he was responding to some of my comments. He said, I taught there. He taught at my school. <laughs> he taught at my school. The NIH wow. has an unaccredited school that's probably one of the most respected unaccredited schools. Uh, the, it's, uh, the professors that teach there are, are often the researchers and they give some of the latest. Oh, there it is. I taught environment biology and health science. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, it's a, it's a wonderful environment. I highly recommend anyone uh, to go there. They created the school to help. Um, there are a lot of people that are like, say, physicists, mathematicians, computer scientists, engineers that end up being recruited to be part of the research teams at the NIH to do biology, medical, really med medical research. And so some of them have no biology background, but they need to get retrained and retrained quickly. So that that school there met a need. Uh, but because it's taught by a lot of the researchers, it's very well respected. Um, some of my classmates were Johns Hopkins PhDs getting getting credit there. And it's kind of strange to be in some of the classes that like might be ba considered somewhat basic. A lot of my classmates were po postdoctoral fellows already in their, in their field. It was just a strange feeling. So it's a pleasure meeting you, Dr. Gart, and it's it's a pleasure meeting someone who is a faculty member at my school. I'm I'm very proud of that school. They they don't have a lot of courses, but I've learned a lot, and it's just a great climate to be there. Uh, very encouraging and supportive, and um, uh, very affordable. Very affordable for someone who just wants to learn. So did you have actually already some direct interaction with Sai uh, Sal? No, never. Uh, only through the internet, and I, I've heard yeah. of him through you, and I, I saw him in his debate with Erica, you, and uh, John Maddox. 
but I I was very impressed. Um, I heard about him through Joshua Schwamidas, who highlighted his Christian testimony, and I was very moved to hear it. So, um, so I, sh I think we should set up, I think we should set up a conversation like uh, I had on my channel between Sai and Dimitar. So you got you two can have some uh, chats uh, in regards of uh, the topics that we love to talk about. And, and, and even beyond that, just talking about science, I respect people who are biochemists and especially in the medical field. I, I just wanna, you know, now that I'm having to work with biochemists, even though my boss is a geneticist, he is very open-minded. He, he had me work with biochemists and molecular biologists to, to be my mentors. And um, in the process, I just had tremendous um, respect. I, 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 my respect for the discipline grew. So uh, yes, uh, Dr. Gart said the students were fantastic, really hard workers. Yes, yes. These are postdoctoral students going back to sometimes be taking undergraduate classes. Um, so <laughs> they're, uh, it's just a great environment. 30,000 people there on the NIH campus and connected campuses just trying to advance medical research. It's just just exciting to be there. So, yeah. um, well, um, perhaps we could uh, meet tomorrow. I can talk about a totally yeah. light topic. It's not really focused on biology, but it's, it's something that I wanted to talk about, some of my concern of what's happening in academia, and then also why I'm interested in finding alternative means for educating, educating people, because partly because of my experience at uh, that school that Dr. Gart taught at, it was affordable and the quality of education was good. And then I, I, I contrast that with what I see happening in certain other places, other pockets of academia. And um, thankfully I got my degrees when it was still affordable. I couldn't imagine trying to go back to school now. So with that, um, thank you for having me on your show. Yeah. And okay, I thank you uh, Sal for uh, coming to my, to my channel and um, after we finish and end broadcast, uh, we can set up um, eventually um, a topic for tomorrow and see how it goes and how we can continue this. Okay, so thank you every, to everyone which has assisted our stream tonight. Um, uh, I hope I'll see you tomorrow again and we'll set up something with Zell. And if you uh, want to participate and join our conversations, feel free to do so. So have a good night, everyone. See you next time. Bye-bye.